So today in the lab I'm working again on my Amiga 4000 and today I want to show you a special feature of the Cyberstorm Accelerator card that I'm putting in this machine. So I imagine most Amiga users know that if you reboot or power on your Amiga and hold down the left and right mouse button while it's powering up or rebooting that you'll be presented with this early startup control screen. This has existed since Kickstart 2 or maybe 1.4 which was the weird transitional Amiga 3000 one but this is a pretty basic boot menu that allows you to you know set what drive you're booting from set some display options do some very basic expansion board diagnostics and uh, you know boot without a startup sequence and a few other options here I think most of me users are familiar with this menu but did you know that the Cyberstorm PPC has its own early boot up menu? So to get into that, we'll reboot the Amiga again and this time hold down the escape key. And now we're presented with this new menu. So this is the Cyberstorm early boot up menu. And I don't know if this was present in the earliest ROMs of the Cyberstorm PPC Accelerator, but certainly by the later ROMs that were in it, it, it was there. And there's several interesting things that we can configure here, some of which are no longer useful now that we have Amiga OS 3.2, but they're still interesting. Alright, so let's go through these different menus here one at a time, and I'm going to start from the bottom and go up. So the bottom most menu here is a system menu, and this just has a grab bag of things. Um, the bottom stuff here, superscalar, branch cache, and write buffer, these are common processor options that you can flip off and on to enable compatibility with older programs or programs that were poorly written. Um, I normally don't mess with these. A lot of times you have to do it for old games and things like that. Next up is this 31 kilohertz screen option. So this was very useful back in the day for Kickstart version 3.0 and 3.1, but now that we have uh, a later version of Kickstart 3.2, 3.1.4, this option is kind of no longer relevant. So what it does is it makes the output of the early boot up screens be VGA compatible. So on AGA machines, um, AGA can output VGA native video signal no problem. These are called double modes. But Kickstart 3 and Kickstart 3.1 were hard coded to output Amiga native video at 15 kilohertz. This was really annoying. And so this little patch here, this setting, would patch that so that you could get into the early boot up menu without having to have an Amiga native monitor or a scan doubler or a flicker fixer it would just output native VGA video. This is something Commodore should have put into the ROMs from the beginning but just didn't and was fixed many years later by Hyperion either in 3.1.4 or 3.2 I forget but now in those native ROMs you can switch to double mode I think by pressing the spacebar. So this last set of options up here at the top are around map ROM. So this is a common feature of accelerator cards. You map the ROM from the kickstart into some place into fast RAM. And this speeds up everything uh, because the fast RAM presumably is faster than reading directly from the ROMs itself. Now once you do the map ROM, the Cyberstorm can also apply various common patches to it. So this first one here, Mac Patch, if you're familiar with Shapeshifter, in order to run Shapeshifter you have to modify the memory addresses of some things at very low memory. And there's a command called PreppyMUL that does that for you. However, the Cyberstorm can do that for you in boot up at ROM time, so that's what this is for. Now, with Amiga OS 3.2, you no longer need to run PreppyMUL or do this Mac Patch thing. So this is another one of these kind of irrelevant options or obsolete options. These next two here control whether or not to load the libraries or the device drivers for the SCSI and IDE adapters 
that were on the motherboard for various Amigas. So the no SCSI patch takes care of the SCSI controllers on the Amiga 3000, Amiga 3000T, and the ID controllers on the Amiga 4000 and Amiga 4000 Tower. And then no NCR SCSI patch takes care of the SCSI controller on the Amiga 4000 Tower. So if you have no SCSI patch, then those things are enabled. If you set it to SCSI patch, then um, either the SCSI or the IDE is, is disabled and it doesn't even load. And this is useful because it can shave down the boot up time sometimes, um, especially if you're not using uh, these. It also saves a little bit of memory. Um, so since I'm using both of these, I don't, or well, when I had my, this in my 4000T, I was using both of these, and since when I have it here in my, my 4000, I'm, I'm using the IDE, so I don't need these patches, but it's still nice that they're there. This last one, no checksum patch, is a bit of a mystery to me. So during boot up, one of the early actions is to perform a checksum of all the kickstart code. And if that checksum fails, you get a red screen. A lot of times, that's indicative of a bad ROM chip. Like something actually has physically gone wrong with your ROM chip. But it could also indicate other things. Um, and this patch here, if you set it to checksum patch, that disables that part of the startup routine. Now, I don't know why you'd want to do this. And I can't find any documentation online for why. If someone knows, please enlighten me. All right, next up is RAM. So this controls your RAM settings. These are very important to have right. And I have 70 nanosecond RAM, so I keep it like that. You can also, if you have 60 nanosecond RAM, you can set that. Or there's a way to do free configuration here if you want to. But um, I found this this works for my system. If you get this wrong, it's likely that the PowerPC processor won't work. Um, if you try and run PowerPC programs, they'll just crash if you get this RAM wrong. And that's because the timings between the PowerPC side and the 68K side are very delicate. So if you if you don't have this set right, they're, they're, they get confused on timing and it's it's overall a bad thing. In fact, I recently saw a Cyberstorm PPC on eBay go as parts because they couldn't get the PowerPC to work, and I suspect it was because they had this screen wrong. They had the wrong RAM settings, and so that causes basically every PowerPC program to crash. So I'm going to skip over CDFS for a moment and go into the SCSI menu. Now this menu allows you to set a lot of parameters related to all of the devices on the ultra wide SCSI controller and some settings for the controller itself. Now normally I just use this screen to toggle stuff off and on. Now the reason you might want to toggle stuff off is again it shaves time off the boot up. If you're scanning for devices that aren't there then that takes time. So telling the Cyberstorm that they're not there will reduce your startup time. And in fact, when I first got this, I guess the previous owner didn't use the SCSI bus at all, so he had everything off. And it took me a while to figure out that I had to turn stuff on again to see SCSI devices. So right now I have everything off. And if you remember in the beginning of the video when I was showing the early startup screen, I only had DF0, I only had my floppy drive. That's because all of these were off. Now I have a drive set in unit 3, so if I double click here, I can turn this on by setting it to one or more LUNs. I don't want to get into too much detail about LUNs, it's a SCSI topic, but know that for your normal hard drive or emulated hard drive, you would just say one LUN. Um, more than one LUN are for things like CD changers or tape drives, rather I should say tape libraries, and it's just not common. Now there's a bunch of other settings here that you can set. I found that it's best not to mess with any of these other settings. It's better to set them in software in other ways. Uh, but you could potentially set this to be synchronous or asynchronous, the bus width, 
uh, reselection support whether or not it's mounted by the kickstart and whether or not it's removable. I just leave all this stuff to auto and I find that generally that works out best and then for things that are performance wise like synchronous versus asynchronous there are other ways to set those that are better. So let's see I also have a CD-ROM drive and so now if I hit return and save this will boot up off my disk because now it now it sees it now if I reboot again and hold down left and right mouse button I can now see my disks here right they were not there before now they are and that's because I enabled that target that SCSI ID in the Cyberstorm PPC's early startup. So the last thing I want to talk about is how the Cyberstorm handles CD-ROM drives. So with the Cyberstorm you can in this menu specify options for the CD-ROM drive. There are two available. One is CD-ROM mount and the other is CD-ROM boot. So CD-ROM mount will look at the CD-ROM drive and mount it as a file system depending on what's on the disk and this can be useful sometimes if you don't have the CD-ROM handler loaded um, although I've never really needed this option. CD-ROM boot actually allows you to boot from a CD-ROM drive. Um, now this was a feature previously only on like the CD-TV or the CD-32, but here we can boot off of a CD-ROM drive. Again, not super useful because this feature was only on the Cyberstorm PPC so far as I know, so it wasn't widely adopted in the Amiga world. But I do have an Amiga OS 4.1 Final Edition disk that I can boot from. Now it doesn't completely boot <laughs> but I can at least start the boot from it so if we set this to CD-ROM boot and then uh, there are some options here around cache and RDB scan if you want to use them but I'm gonna set these to no if I save this and then go into my early boot up screen by holding down both mouse buttons I can now see I have CD0 as a bootable device and I can use this to boot. And this is now booting off the CD-ROM. Now this will fail. I'm not immediately sure why, but this is not a problem with the booting, it's a problem with the CD, I think. So thank you all for watching. And next time we'll get into SCSI disk performance with this rig. And I can tell you right now I've been getting some pretty impressive numbers. So stay tuned for next time. <laughs>